guess I mean, by way of introduction, um, if you have been around during any any time in the last, say, you know, 30 or 40 years, and you have an interest in Cape science, and you can read, then you will know <laughs> who Art and Peg Palmer are and Will and, will and Matt White, unless you maybe been living in a cave somewhere or something. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I guess I guess I would I would say, um, you know, if, if there are people in this community that, you know, that uh, that, that don't need introductions, it, it, it's them. And the um, uh, you'll you'll hear kind of more about their their backgrounds coming up. Um, but uh, you know, I, I would say from you know from from my perspective of you know sort of my view of the of these people and the accomplishments um, is that you know I, I thought you know more than once that you know in in sort of the whole you know uh, the, the parade you know of, of life you know we can show up at, at any time and and the fact that all of us have had to you know sort of show up in this generation at the same time you know that we're all here together you know I, I celebrate and and the fact that you know as, as somebody interested in caves you know that that you know I've happened to plop down the earth you know in the same generation you know as, as these people and so many contributions that they've made to cave science um, I, I would say there's two, two really important things um, that that this this group has, has done you know um you know both on their own and, and collectively and that is that they're cavers and you know that that you know 20 or 30 or 40 years ago you know, or, or you know even more recently um you know there was there was hydrogeologists um and then there was you know there was those other sort of cave people and and that you know if you did cave stuff it was it was for fun or it was sport and it wasn't taken seriously um they they're they're cavers first and became scientists along the way. Um, I, I think I think um, Will kind of recruited that you know somewhere along the way. Um, but but the other very very important thing in my mind is that a thing that these you know th this this crowd has uh, has been among the people to revolutionize and that's to quantify things um, and and to go from a you know let's say a qualitative descriptive you know, view of, of understanding of how things work to a quantitative view, both with, uh, you know, with, with chemistry, you know, Will, you know, was a pioneer when information about the kinetics of calcite dissolution, you know, was coming out of USGS or other laboratories, um, you know, to you know, sort of immediately grab that stuff um, and, and apply it to car science. And, and the same thing with, with, um, uh, with, with Art and Peg um, in, in the case of modeling and, and, and physics and Art was, you know, a uh, you know, classic paper in uh, 1991 where you know, he was around the same time as Wolfgang Drybrot and, and, you know, they, you know, they, they both started applying, you know, the, the, the physics of, of flow, the, the chemistry of limestone dissolution. And so now, you know, the, you know, with, with the, um, you know, it, it, it's old news now, you know, that we, you know, try to be quantitative whenever possible, but that it wasn't always like that. And I, and I think if anybody, uh, you know, the four of these people, you know, helped that, you know, nothing short of a revolution in car science. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop uh, for the moment. And so, um, uh, so Sarah Arpin, so Sarah's driving the bus on this one. Can you go ahead and bring up uh, Will's uh, presentation, please? Okay, I just need to um, turn the sound on, and so that should be good. Let's see. Um, uh, sorry, earlier I tried this out and I could see presenter mode and it would just play. So I need to get that to work. Okay. Um, I apologize. Thank you, Well, we can try it this way. Um, I did have a presenter mode earlier. Okay, I'm going to open this uh, field trip by saying welcome to the Karst Hydrology of Mammoth Game National Park. 
work a virtual field trip and we'll try to show you at least the essential features of what constitutes the Central Kentucky Karst. We need to uh, begin with a quick overview of the regional challenge. Here, the geologic setting. Uh, the Mammoth Cave area has a relatively gentle regional dip to the northwest, and it can be considered as the western flank of the Cincinnati Arch or the eastern edge of the Illinois Basin. There's a good deal of minor folding and many small faults. Uh, many of these can be seen in the caves. And there's a much stronger monoclinal fold near the Dripping Springs escarpment that has served to retard the erosion into the plateau. Uh, here's a, a view of the stratigraphy, a stratigraphic column constructed by R. Palmer quite a number of years ago. The uh, key beds are the big clifty sandstone, which act as a protective uh, top to the ridge tops, and the Salem and Harrodsburg or Warsaw formation that serve as an aquaclude. And in between are the Gherkin, the St. Genevieve, and the St. Louis limestone, which are the hosts for Mammoth Cave. These have a very complicated lithology as shown on the strat column on the right. Our uh, primary objective on this field trip is to examine the overall flow pattern on a regional scale. Where base level, ultimate base level and ultimate discharge is the Green River. There are many small surface streams that rise on the relatively insoluble Salem and Warsaw formations on the southeast side. These all sink into the lower units of the St. Louis and St. Genevieve and follow underground routes all the way to the river. There are no surface streams crossing and surface runoff on the plateau also sinks into the top of the Gherkin limestone. So here's the entire drainage basin. You see the Green River to the northwest, which is the discharge point for the basin, and a drainage divide between the Green River drainage and drainage into the Barren River on the southeast. Streams along the southeast edge drain to the northwest and disappear into the limestone and reappear as a series of big springs along Green River. Each of the springs has its own drainage basin and the basin boundaries that are shown in this map were developed by the late Jim Quinlan and his associates based on something in excess of 500 dye traces, the uh, groundwater table, and information from cave passages. It's uh, possible to put all this information together in the form of a flow sheet. If we begin with rain on the plateau and on the sinkhole plain, the drains are sinking streams on the eastern edge, the sinkhole plain itself, karst valleys on the plateau, and then drainage off the edge of the sandstone, which each of those sources makes its way uh, down through the depth of the aquifer, eventually into a base level conduit system, and from there out to the Green River. We'll uh, begin our tour with the Green River itself down at base level. This is the Green River at Mammoth Cave Ferry, and uh, it's an alluviated river. There's 12, 10 to 20 meters of alluvial sediment in the channel. Flows in a deep canyon, so a very narrow canyon. So that is subject to flooding. Heavy rainstorms in the upper Green River Basin can bring the level of the Green River up by 30, 40, 50 feet. Pike Spring drains the Flint Ridge section of Mammoth Cave. 
in this photograph, we actually captured the reversal of flow that takes place when Green River goes into flood. When the uh, team arrived, the water was flowing out of the spring, and there was a stream of clear water going down from along the muddy uh, water of the Green River. Uh, we were watching the uh, flow stopped. The leaves which had fallen into the stream were stationary, and then a few moments later, the flow reversed, and muddy river water was flowing back into the spring, and the leaves were being sucked into the spring. The flooding takes place whenever the river rises, and it can force river water distances of kilometers back into the cave system. Echo River and the uh, interconnected Styx River springs drain Mammoth Cave Ridge. This on the left is the rise pool. The passage or conduit that feeds the spring is completely flooded, but divers have explored almost 3,000 feet uh, back into the flooded cave system and emerged in what is called Echo River in Mammoth Cave. The spring is set back from the riverbank by a oh, quarter of a mile or so and is connected to the river by an alluviated channel as shown on the right frame. The uh, overall topography of the Mammoth Cave Plateau is well shown on this uh, 1933 topographic map of the proposed National Park. Uh, there are flat top ridges supported by the uh, Big Clifty Sandstone, but the sandstone has been breached in many places to form karst valleys, which although they appear to be tributaries of the uh, river, in fact are all blind valleys. There's no surface channel with flowing water that leads from these valleys out to the river. There are also large collapsed sinkholes scattered about this map where the sandstone has collapsed into underlying cave passages. Roads uh, crossing the Dripping Springs Escarpment expose the uh, upper section of the limestone. These four examples show you the epicarst of the highly dissolved and highly um, Fisher limestone surface. I call your attention to the upper right hand frame, which exposes the cross section of a drain, and the two lower frames, which show deeply uh, weathered uh, solution along the fractures. Uh, these pathways provide a rapid drainage of water from the surface and drainage down into the underlying karst aquifer. And so we move out onto the sinkhole plain, which as the name implies is going to give us a view of miles and miles and miles of sinkholes. Most of the sinkholes are soil mantled, but there are soil collapses, bedrock uh, dissolution and bedrock collapse both play a role. The sinks act as funnels for rainwater and plugs of clay soil seal the sinks so you can get both ephemeral and more or less permanent uh, ponds. These ponds are somewhat of a risk because soil piping failures can drain the pond in a matter of hours. It is possible to farm parts of a sinkhole plain. On the upper left is a section of a series of sinkholes and it's fairly obvious that some farmer has driven his tractor up and down through these things. But many of the portions of the sinkhole plain are more like the frame on the right where there are deep collapsed sinkholes and the land has to remain in pasture. The uh, sinkhole ponds are illustrated below. On the left is a, uh, what I'm pretty sure is an ephemeral pond, simply a puddle of water left over from the last rainstorm, a more permanent pond on the right. The sinkholes act as internal runoff. They collect the rainwater and funnel it down through a drain at the bottom of the sinkhole 
or infiltrate through the soil at the bottom of the sinkhole and from there down into the conduit system below. This uh, large compound sink is almost in, certainly a collapsed cave passage. Uh, Crump Cave, outside of the town of Smith's Grove, Kentucky, extends up in this direction, and this is probably an extension of the cave which has fallen in. You note that the uh, sinkhole at the far end of the uh, depression is deeper than the two foreground sinkholes that hold ponds. We have reached the edge of the sinkhole plain to the sink of Little Sinking Creek. It's a moderate-sized sinking stream. It flows along the alluvial floor of a blind valley and disappears beneath the limestone headwall at the end of the valley. The possible cave entrance, which should be there, is plugged with logs and debris and other material that's washed in by the stream. So when there is a high flow, such as in spring rains or spring snow melt, the water tends to back up and you form a lake, uh, which extends a considerable distance up the Blind Valley. If uh, you want an exceptionally good view of the sinkholes of the sinkhole plain, I recommend driving Kentucky Route 259 north from uh, U.S. Highway 68 through the little village of Rocky Hill, continue across the sinkhole plain, and cross U.S. 31W and now uh, Highway I-65 and up onto the plateau. And there is an excellent display of sinkholes on many size scales uh, in many different shapes. To give you some additional perspective on the sinkhole plain, here's a uh, profile constructed from topographic and geologic maps that will give you an idea of what the countryside looks like along Highway 259. You can see the monocline, which changes the structure rather abruptly at the edge of the Dripping Springs Escarpment, or Chester Escarpment, and I call your attention to Cedar Sink, uh, which is a karst window formed by collapse of the sandstone roof uh, and collapse of the valley floor at the bottom of Smith Valley. The bottom of Cedar Sink actually reaches almost to the level of Green River. Cedar Sink is a collapse uh, and uh, right on the main flow line heading from the sinkhole plain to the Turnhole Spring. So the collapse blocked the flow of water which then developed bypass routes around both sides of the sinkhole. On the right side in the northeast corner is Smith Valley Cave and several other cave openings which give access to that portion of the cut around. And at the north end of the sink is Owl Cave, a fragment of large trunk passage, and at the bottom of it is the main flow to sinkhole, to Turnhole Spring, crossing the bottom of Owl Cave, and it makes an excellent sampling point for the uh, Turnhole flow line. The entrance to Smith Valley Cave on the northeast corner of Cedar Sink emits enough cold air which lies in the bottom of the sinkhole and actually forms a fog layer in the, against the uh, hot, humid weather in south central Kentucky. You can see the top of the cliff through the fog and this represents the top of a, a very large overhang that loops around the end of the sink and has every appearance of being a fragment of collapsed cave passage. On the uh, right hand panel is an aerial view of, of Turnhole Spring taken by Gordon Smith a number of years ago. 
It's a rise pool at the base of a steep bluff right on the bank of the river. Jim Quinlan's map of the Turnhole Spring shows that the rise pool is about 53 feet below river level. Also shown on the map uh, to the left of the rise pool is Sand House Cave, which is a large shelter cave, highly alluviated, which acts as a uh, stormwater overflow when the water exceeds the capacity of the main channel. And so we have gone from the Green River all the way south to the southeast edge of the Sinkhole Plain and back to the Green River again along a different drainage line. And this completes the virtual tour of the surface drainage basins. Sorry, I was muted. So, uh, yeah, th th thanks, Will. Um, and I don't think I have seen questions come through the chat. Oh, wait a minute. There, there we go. Um, so there's a um, question from Jacob Barker, and that is, can we visually differentiate between ephemeral ponding that is formed over a sinkhole versus water that ponds over an aquatard horizon like a, a frangipan? Let's say, well, uh, actually, can y'all hear me? I should have checked that first. Sarah, can you hear me? Or Will, did you hear that? I heard it. Uh, well, in some cases, it's pretty easy because there's open cave passages underneath the water-filled sinkholes. So you can walk through and occasionally see water dripping out of the ceiling. It's leaking out of the bottom of the pond. But uh, most of the cases, you would simply keep an eye on the pond, and, and it's a long way above the local water table. We have, Jim Quinlan had a map prepared of the piezometric surface, and if you really wanted to check, you could compare the two. But those are yeah. first ponds, almost all of them. Yeah, that was a good point you made of that, um, the photo that you showed of the compound sinkhole over by Crump's Cave, that the water, the water level in those ponds was higher than the, the one just further away. You know, meaning, you know, that couldn't have been really the water table. So um, I, I do know one um, uh, out in uh, Alberton in Warren County, south of Bowling Green. Um, one time I was, I was at, at, just out there running around the farm and the guy told me there had been a pond um, that had been on the farm for 70 years. And one night, just, just like somebody flushed the toilet. And so kind of ephemeral is a, uh, <laughs> it's a variable term here. Yeah, other, other questions? Okay, um, well, great. Well, feel free to keep them coming. We'll, we'll have plenty of time to chat um, at the, um, uh, at, after uh, Art and Peg's presentation. So Sarah, can you go ahead and boot that up, as they say? Sure, sure. Mammoth Cave has a long and complex geologic history. Recent evidence shows that it's more than four million years old and tells us much about the geomorphic development of North America, including its Pleistocene glaciation. Here's an aerial view of the Mammoth Cave region. In the foreground is the Pennyroyal Plain, a deeply weathered limestone plateau with a thick soil cover. The limestone is Mississippian, early Carboniferous, about 300 million years old. The cave is located in the Chester Upland, the forested region in the background. There the limestone is overlain by resistant sandstone, which helps to protect the underlying caves from erosion. In this show, we examine the cave's geology and geomorphic history. Here's a simplified map of the cave region. Green areas are sandstone-capped ridges. The red circles outline the historic route, our main target, and also Crystal Cave, which supplies helpful supporting information. The Green River flows through the park and serves as the erosional base level for the area. Here's a geologic profile through the cave. 
Much water goes underground in the Kanyaroyal and continues beneath the Chester upland to the deeply entrenched Green River. Additional water enters via the ridge flanks and intervening valleys in the upland. Note the major limestone strata and five levels of cave development. Each level was produced during a pause in uplift of the land when the limestone dissolution was focused at certain elevations for a long time. Mapping of the cave began in the early 1800s. Since 1957, the Cave Research Foundation has directed the exploration, remapping, and survey of new discoveries in cooperation with the National Park Service. In 1970, as part of this project, we began a geologic survey to identify passage levels, limestone beds, and geologic structure. The aim was to interpret the evolution of the cave and its geologic control. Colors on the stratigraphic section identify the limestone beds exposed along the historic tour, which is described here. Here's a map and profile of the historic route. We'll show this again later when we know more about the area. This two-hour cave tour is compressed here into 15 minutes. Here's the historic entrance, located in the Gurton Formation in the flank of the Green River Valley. But the oldest known passage in the system is Collins Avenue at Level A in Crystal Cave. Over most of its length, it's filled almost to the ceiling with sediment because of a rise in base level after the passage formed. Thanks to climate changes or tectonic effects, this base level rise was repeated for every major passage in the upper half of the cave system, but very little in the lower half. Back to the historic tour. The entrance passage leads to Audubon Avenue and Broadway at the northwestern end of the cave. This is level B1, about 600 feet above sea level, or 180 meters. The floor drops as we descend into the so-called main cave at level B2. Here are some relics of saltpeter mining from the early 1800s. The pipes are the hollowed out trunks of local tulip trees. One drained water into the cave while the other carried dissolved nitrates leached from the cave sediment upward to the entrance. One of the major junctions in the cave two independent passages at levels B1 and B2 with entirely different recharge areas. They intersect here but still preserve their original identity. Sand and gravel fill is common in major upper level passages deposited during periodic rises in base level. A side passage leads down to Black Snake Avenue at level C and the Joppa member at an elevation of 550 feet. Sediment is much less abundant at and below this level. Note the black surfaces from the suit of early light sources. For comparison, one of the best examples of level C is located one to two kilometers to the southeast. This is Cleveland Avenue at the same elevation and stratigraphic horizon as Black Snake. Note the lens-shaped cross-section and sparse sediment typical of this level. Turner Avenue in Flint Ridge at the Gurkin St. Genevieve contact is another well-known example at level C. Farther west, Cleveland Avenue becomes larger, having received much water from several tributaries. Here it's known as Big Avenue. Sediment was deposited here by sudden flooding more than a million years ago, perhaps caused by release of water from a nearby lake. Reversals of flow were common while level C was forming. Small solution scallops indicate rapid flow toward the left. The large ones indicate slow flow toward the right. Such variations might be expected during glacial events but the nearest glaciation was apparently about 100 kilometers to the north. 
One of the most significant aspects of level C is that throughout the cave, its active base level passages were suddenly abandoned because of a sharp drop in the level of Green River. On the left, the pass of El Gore is a long canyon that drained water down the dip from Cleveland Avenue to level D. The average dip of the limestone is only about half a degree and the canyon is more than a kilometer long. On the right is a deep canyon cut in the floor of a level C passage in Crystal Cave. X Pit in Crystal Cave is another product of this sudden water table drop below level C formed by waterfalls and intersecting canyons. Back again to our tour of Black Snake Avenue. Here infiltrating water passes through the thin sandstone cap into the limestone forming vertical shafts. The trail passes around Bottomless Pit. An early sign here read Bottomless Pit 105 feet deep. This shaft also extends upward a long distance and has nothing to do with the sudden abandonment of level C. A complex tangle of passages brings us down to Fat Man's Misery. This leads us to Great Relief Hall, a segment of major passage at level D. We're in the middle of the Fredonia member of the St. Genevieve limestone. Note the resistant chert dikes protruding from the ceiling, the dark corroded bed near the floors, the Dolomitic F2 unit. We descend into River Hall, where water is ponded at the level of the Green River. During very high flow, the water slowly rises toward the ceiling. We've reached the lowest stratigraphic level in this part of the cave, in the Horse Cave member of the St. Louis limestone. Nearby Karin's Cascade is very active here after a heavy storm. Try a Google search for Karin to see the origin of this name. Early explorers had vivid imaginations and a good classical education. Nearby Echo River is at the same elevation as Green River on the surface. It leads to Echo River Spring. This was a very popular boat ride at one time, but the difficulty with maintenance was too great. Nearby Echo River Spring drains much of northwestern Mammoth Cave. Stream flow from the spring drains directly into Green River around the corner. Back at River Hall, Sparks Avenue branches off as a low passage with many solutionally enlarged ceiling fissures in the Horse Cave member of the St. Louis Limestone. It leads directly to Mammoth Dome. This is the tallest Vado shaft in the cave. The St. Louis-St. Genevieve contact is located right at the trail level. Nearby are the ruins of Karnak, formed by the entrenchment of a meandering waterfall. It was named after the ancient city of Karnak, Egypt. Only recently did we determine that the uppermost beds in the pillars are composed of the Karnak member of the St. Genevieve formation. It's named after Karnak, Illinois, where the rock unit was first studied. The Illinois town was also named after Karnak, Egypt. We're looking at the final link in this long geographic chain. This flowstone cascade is located across the room from the ruins. It's being deposited by a small trickle of water from the surface. Having absorbed much carbon dioxide from the soil, this water is able to dissolve the limestone on its way down and release some of the gas when it reaches the cave and precipitate calcite. From here we climb a sturdy staircase to the main cave level, B1. Along the way we have a final view down Mammoth Dome. We then follow a dry meandering tube to Audubon Avenue and out via the natural entrance. Here's a composite cross section through most of the major passages in the Mammoth Cave system. Horizontal lines indicate average passage levels, but because of the dip of the beds, the levels appear to be sloping upward to the right. 
adding a rectangular grid for reference, we see that the major passages really do cluster at nearly uniform levels. So they are controlled by fluvial base level rather than by strata. The levels are determined by geomorphic history, not by the rocks. Finally, let's focus on the Pleistocene glaciers. Is there any relation between them and Mammoth Cave? First, we need to know when the various cave passages formed. Quartz-rich sediment is common in Mammoth Cave, and it holds the clues to dating the passages. To obtain these dates, we need the ratio of unstable isotopes aluminum-26 and beryllium-10, trace elements, and the quartz gravel. These isotopes equilibrate to sunlight exposure at and near the surface. In the cave, shielded from solar radiation, the two isotopes decay at different rates. There's an old flash bulb for scales four centimeters long. Measuring the ratio of aluminum to beryllium isotopes tells us the burial age of the quartz sediment. This requires a large particle accelerator such as this one at Purdue University. Lab prep is a long and delicate operation. Here's Daryl's former grad student, Derek Fable, running the accelerator. Here are our main sources of information on the cave versus glacial history. The first is obviously the main source. The second by Peter Clark, David Archer, and others noted a change between early and late Pleistocene glaciation. Here are their major observations followed by ours in Mammoth Cave. Early Pleistocene glaciation in North America was impeded by thick residual sediment on the land surface, which made the ice sheets unstable and unable to extend very far. Later glaciations were less affected in this way and able to extend farther because most pre-glacial sediment had been eroded away by that time. From our observations, this idea is supported by thick sediments in the oldest cave passages but they become much less abundant below level B2. The cave sediments show that the transition took place about 1.3 million years ago. The third source of information is by Lorraine Lisechke and uh, Maureen Ramo, who collected samples from many deep ocean cores to date microfossils and obtain isotopic ratios that identify the relative temperatures. This provides a detailed record of glacial and interglacial events. Here's the resulting glacial history from their work. The preglacial Pliocene is to the left, and the Pleistocene, with its many periodic glaciations, is on the right. Positions of major cave levels, A, B1, etc., are updated and averaged from Granger and others, 2001. Note the relationship between cave levels and glacial events. Levels A and B1 are Pliocene and predate the glaciation. Level B2 appears to be early Pleistocene, but of course there are no indications of glaciation in the cave area. Level C falls in the midst of many glacial events, but the passages show surprisingly little evidence for a major disruption, except for occasional serious flooding, which may have little to do with glaciation. But level C was abruptly abandoned by entrenchment of the Green River about 1.3 million years ago by a sudden drop in base level. This was almost certainly triggered by glacial modification of drainage. Level D shows the effects of displacement of the Ohio River after 1.3 million years. It follows a sudden 15 meter drop in base level. Here's a closer look at the likely sequence for diversion of the Ohio River as a result of glaciation. Map A shows a major diversion of drainage from one to a westerly course into the Mississippi River by way of the now defunct Taze River, labeled 2. Map B shows how further advance of glaciers diverted the drainage toward the southwest into the Ohio River, greatly increasing its flow. The newly invigorated Ohio rapidly entrenched its bed. The Green River, so important to Mammoth Cave, is a tributary of the Ohio in that zone of rapid entrenchment. Its downward erosion was accelerated by waterfalls and rapids progressing upstream toward the southeast, following the sequence A, B, and C. When the river eroded past Mammoth Cave, the cave streams cut downward rapidly to form canyons and shafts, as shown earlier. 
So caves and glaciers are governed by entirely different processes, so the convergence in their interpretations helps to support the hypotheses on timing, process, and geomorphic outcome for both. Thanks for your interest. If you want a review of the historic route, see the map on the next page. myself again so um, yeah that's great thank you thank you so much and so um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll just ask that this is recorded um, and so now everyone's got a copy and this, these two have been a, a sort of classic d description of the South Central Kentucky cars so are you all okay with this sort of just being distributed to the to the world now because I think these will be instant classics so um, if that's okay so, uh, well, we have, let's see, we, we have 20 minutes and um, we thought we'd do something fun, <laughs> in, in my opinion, and, and kind of break away from the science just a little bit. And that is that the other thing, those those of you that know, um, you know, the, these these two couples, uh, you know, very much two teams, um, will know the other thing that's, that's uh, may, maybe extraordinary is that even though these are among the most accomplished, um, you know, sort of scientists in their field anywhere in the world, uh, they're still very, very regular um, people and <laughs> fun to be around. And so, um, so I, I thought we would just take take some time and just learn a little bit more about these these uh, these, these people uh, with with just some informal interview questions. If any of you have questions, just just feel free to shout out. Um, or, or chat anyway. Um, one thing I, I want to make an announcement about um, is um, we're actually going to have a uh, um, an extra 15 minute kind of impromptu um, presentation after this one, and that is that Professor uh, Xiao Jianhua from the Carson Institute in Gui, Guilin is uh, has joined us. He and um, several of his colleagues, including um, another world Cars master Yuan Daoshan, have, have been kind of with us. And, um, and it turns out uh, that just uh, very recently, um, one of the most spectacular sort of cars parks anywhere, at least that I've seen, um, the Shangxi Geopark uh, on the, um, in the Western Hunan, China, um, has just been approved as part of the Global Geopark Network. And uh, this is at the edge of the, the Guizhou Hunan uh, Plateau, and just, just um, you know, essentially like the Cumberland Plateau Escarpment, but on like triple steroids. And so just spectacular and, and um, uh, Professor Tsao has, has um, offered to show a, um, about a, a 15 minute uh, video um, as soon as we get done with this one. So, so if you have time, we'll do it on this link. Um, you know, feel, feel free to, to stick around. So um, let me, so, so I'm, um, you know, I, I said before that, you know, I, I feel blessed to have sort of shown up, you know, in the same generation as Art and Peg and, and, and Will and Bet, and um, we've all known each other for a long time. I'm going to just say two very, very brief personal anecdotes, and that is the, the very first, uh, among days of first knowing Art and Peg was when I came uh, to Mammoth Cave and took their cars geology class in uh, 1981, it's kind of going back there, um, and um, so we went through the, the, the class, and and so we're having this big long trip on Saturday that, that, that they like to do. And we were going back to a place um, <laughs> that, that I was looking forward to called Agony Avenue, which I didn't know anything about other than its name. And so, uh, so we're, you know, asking questions about the, um, you know, about the trip. And, and, and I think this is accurate. It's from my, from my memory many years ago. But somebody in the group said, Art, are we, are we going to, is there going to be any water? Are we going to get wet at all? And Art said, well, it, it just really no, no more than knee deep. And my memory, Peg goes, oh, art. And, and I didn't know what that meant. Um, we found out later that the water, in fact, the, the deepest we got on the cave trip was knee deep. Um, but the passage is only two, three feet high. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, the, there's uh, a, a long history of various uh, cons, they call them, in, in that area of the world. Um, uh, to, for, I was with Will and it, when he was teaching his class um, sometime. And we were at Cedar Sink, which he's just mentioned. And um, at, at, at that time, there was a grad student uh, at WKU, Darlene um, uh, Anthony, some, some of you know, and uh, larger than life <laughs> character. And so we were on the field trip and, and, and Will is explaining about, you know, cedar sink forming. And he said, well, over here, you know, it, it's, it's apparently a collapse 
you know, from the, you know, from a, a big K passage. And you can see this uh, big S band, you know, along in the wall here. And Darlene just starts like laughing. And, you know, she wasn't <laughs> being rude at all. And just the whole rest of the trip, she's just like snickering. And uh, so later on, you know, whatever I had a moment, I said, Darlene, what was so funny? You said, <laughs> she said, Will Wade caught her big ass bed. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, um, I don't know if I pronounce that, a big ass bend. She said, I can't believe Will would say that. So anyway, um, you had to be there. <laughs> so um, the, uh, so any, anyway, let me ask, um, Peg, question for you. How did you two end up together? Or, or, or how did you find one another? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we met on a geology field trip at Indiana University, and it was to the coast of southern Indiana, and that was our thesis area. So he showed me around, and he introduced me to his caving friends who were mapping a very large cave system in the area. They were hard-charging, dedicated, very competent, lovely kids. And they accept me, uh, accepted me into their tightly knit group. So you combine caving with geology and teamwork and you get adventure. What more could you ask for? <laughs> Great. And were you a caver before that? No. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and Art, I, I think you had, you had been, you started caving long before that, I think, in Massachusetts. Is that right? Well, yes, actually, I was born in western Massachusetts in a very propitious place because the uh, author of three cave books, Clay Perry, lived in Pittsfield, Mass., where I, where I was growing up. And I talked to Clay, and he said, boy, you know, you ought to go here and here and here and here. He really got us started. Us being myself and my younger brother, who was uh, tagging along, but just as excited. Um, I went to Williams College, which is a stone's throw from my uh, birthplace, and um, I uh, decided to do a uh, mass, uh, actually a uh, honors thesis on cave origin, actually a specific cave in New York State. And so I uh, did that, and I had to delve into the literature, and this is important. I looked around for what was available, and the best sources by far were those of Will White. Yep. Thank you, Will. You, you saved my neck <laughs> as, as the uh, time dwindled for my thesis to be submitted. I was able to use his sources as a tremendous uh, boost. And that, that puts us into perspective. You probably are thinking that we, we grew up together or, or same ages and so forth, but I was miles behind Will. Right. Well, that certainly have uh, influenced one another. So, and uh, Peg, Peg stepped up. I guess, I guess I have a question without too much detail. Um, well, there, there, there's Peg. So you all met on this, this field trip. And again, with, without too much detail, um, how long did it take you to figure out that you, you two had interests beyond in each other, kind of beyond caves and, and geology. So. Oh, <laughs> it's it's just, it, yeah, it was a friendship. Um, working for a common goal, I'd say, really pulls you together. And here you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was very lucky. Oh, so was I. Right. <laughs> well put. Well, Beth, let me pose the same question to you. So how, how did you uh, run into this character? Okay. Well, it was about 60 years ago that Will was working in the Swego Creek area, and there were about a half a dozen caves down there that uh, the entrances, he didn't know how the entrances were related to each other. So uh, he heard he wanted somebody to survey these entrances and he heard about this undergraduate civil engineering student at the University of Pittsburgh. And he said, well, uh, well, why don't I just ask her to come down? And so I came down with another fellow civil engineering student and we surveyed the entrances of the caves and um, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> I guess it is. And so had you, been, had you had an interest in caves before that, Beth? 
I had never been in a cave. I had no idea what a cave was. Uh, <laughs> this was a whole new experience for me. Yeah. And how did you all end up coming down to Mammoth Cave in the first place? Well, there's an interesting historical tale to that because the uh, cave, the very beginning of the Cave Research Foundation is that they were surveying in the Flint Ridge system. But the Flint Ridge cave entrances were bought by the Park Service in the early uh, 60s, and there was a very good chance that they were simply going to get kicked out. So in order to get something justified to get a use permit or agreement with the Park Service, they figured they needed uh, science, because science projects have a lot more pizzazz to them than just cave surveys. So we're looking around for cave scientists, and it turns out there wasn't a heck of a lot of them around in 1960. So they snagged George Dyke to write his PhD thesis on Mammoth Cave, and they snagged me uh, to come down there in the summer of 1961, Beth and I, and looked into Mammoth Cave, and I said, boy, there are interesting problems all over the place, and they're free for the picking. So we kept coming back for year after year after year. Right, yeah. Well, Art, what about you? How did you, when did you get down there? And what, what, what attract, well, I guess the cave attracted you, but how, how did that end up working out? Um, well, 1965, I was a PhD student at Indiana University and um, doing a thesis on uh, cave geology, of course. And um, there was an NSS convention held in 1965, and uh, I was asked to present a short session on cave, uh, on cave mapping. And in the audience were three people that uh, I sort of knew uh, from reading, and uh, they were uh, Jim Dyer of Crystal Cave fame and two younger people, uh, Joe Davidson and uh, John Bridge. After the talk, they came up to me and I sort of wondered what was going to happen. They said, uh, very interesting talk. Do you want to see a cave? And I said, sure, I'd love to. I knew which cave they were talking about. And I said, do you want to see a cave? <laughs> so uh, a couple of days later, we saddled up and went into Blue Spring Cave, which at that time was number four in the world in length, in wow. survey length believe it or not. Now it's something like 400s on the list. <laughs> but um, we went in one entrance and we uh, watched for about uh, well, several hours and came to a river passage. And there was a boat docked there. And so we jumped in the, in the boat and paddled our way two miles downstream to another entrance and exited after about 15 hours. So that uh, settled that little score as to <laughs> whether Indiana had caves or not. And uh, I was able to go down to um, the next expedition and that's when we went underneath um, the uh, valley from Flint Ridge to Mammoth Cave Ridge. Couldn't make any connection, but we have made the connection underneath the river or underneath the valley. Yeah. So the exciting trip for me. So, so in that time, was was that after Crystal Cave had been sold to the park, or was it because that was around that same time? I mean, was Crystal Cave still private then? Uh, no, it it was uh, had been turned over to the park. Oh, okay, okay, great, great. And then Peg, did, did, did you um, did, were you down on that trip, or when no, did you? No, no. Uh, when did your first trip was sixty seven, I believe. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay, great. great. That was down to the same area. Yeah. It was about a 24-hour trip. And um, in some ways, it was worse than the underneath the valley trip. There was lots of wading through water up to your neck and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it made me slightly warmer than Indiana. I don't know. <laughs> maybe a degree. Yeah. It was, it was a lot something. drier, drier than Indiana, too. Yeah, well, it's certainly warmer than caves up in New York and uh, Massachusetts. I remember uh, the first um, 
tour I ever went in with as a little kid was uh, House Caverns up in New York. And my, my, my clearest memory, and, and I was just so thrilled, uh, was uh, there was a pool, you know, somewhere along the, the tour path, I remember. And I remember sticking my finger in there and said, holy smoke, forget that. So uh, at least it's a little bit warmer down here. So so, so here, here's a question. And um, I don't know what, what you all will sort of know, but some, some I've, I've been thinking about a lot um, in recent years is, and, and I guess there's sort of a, two, a two-part question, and one is, for Mammoth Cave, you know, certainly there's a lot of attention uh, to Mammoth Cave, both in science and exploring, a lot's been done here, and lots of people are, you know, are attracted to come here, and I've, I've wondered two things. Uh, one is, how much of that, you know, it's, it's certainly a great karst landscape, but I, I guess how much of the attention is due to the fact that it's the longest cave, you know, on the list. And if it was second or if it was third, you know, whether the whole character, you know, would have been very different than what we see here. And then the other um, question, you know, that, that, that is what I've been thinking about a lot, uh, is it in fact the longest cave in the world? You know, certainly it's the longest cave we know about. Um, and, and I guess I'm mindful that um, if you look at number two on the list and number four on the list down in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, those are in the same general vicinity. And if they were connected right now, uh, and I checked the long cave list yesterday, uh, they would be 399 miles. Um, and there's plenty more where that came from. Um, so, it, so, the, so if we ask the question, where is the longest cave in the world? Not the longest known cave, but the longest cave, that, that seems to be a possibility. Um, you know, certainly in China, there's, you know, there's, there's a caves over 100 kilometers now, you know, that they're just, just being explored. So there's a huge amount to find there. Uh, one thing uh, that I'll, I, I guess I'll show my ignorance because I just don't know much about the Black Hills. Uh, could Wind and Jewel so, sometimes connect? Is, is that at least feasible? And, and, you know, what does that look? So, so starting with you, Art and Peg, what, what's, what, where, where do you think the longest cave in the world might be? Is it, is it Mammoth Cave? You asked about the Black Hills and Peg says no, just as I was thinking yes. <laughs> <laughs> Their first fight in 40 years. <laughs> Because, because um, they have still been making breakthroughs in wind and fuel uh, just this last year, and they go on and on and on. Um, so in terms of sheer length, it's easy to rack up a lot of length in a maze cave. So it's kind of an unfavorable... But they won't be connected. They, oh, they won't be connected, no. no. But either oh, it's not geologically has, feasible? Either one of them has a chance of being the longest. In terms oh, of okay. Map to length. Yeah. So, so each one individually could potentially be, uh, but it's geologically not feasible for them to connect. I just don't know. No. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and then, and what, what's your take on sort of how much of the hype of Mammoth Cave is just being number one? Um, you know, what, what would it look like if it was the third longest cave in the world? How would how would things be different? You know, after your careers. There's so much of it that there are examples of everything, and it relates to the geomorphic history of the uh, entire U uh, eastern U.S. Yeah, yeah, that that's a good point. You know, with Daryl's well, your all's work of sort of tying through the Ohio River, that, that's that's a really good point. So, 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 well, what what what's your sense? Is is Mammoth Cave really the longest cave in the world in in reality, or or what what are the probabilities? I mean, you're really comparing apples and oranges because Mammoth Cave is a, a series of interconnected drainage lines within a distinct drainage basin. And uh, the uh, caves along the east coast of Yucatan and also the caves of the Black Hills are network mazes. Yeah. Each of them by a different mechanism. So yeah, you could probably rack up a tremendous amount of length depending on how much you want. I know there's one cave in Alabama that's got 13 miles of passage and it's in a, underneath a meadow that's about a quarter of a mile across. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I think Mammoth Cave is not likely to retain its status, but it's going to take a while for the Black Hills to catch up. Yeah. I, a diver going through one key connection down in the in container room might very well break the record in one, one trip. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess my fantasy is is a time when there's an announcement from Mexico 
saying, oh, we just made this connection and there's some other cave we've been mapping. And, and in fact, you know, we have just passed Mammoth Cave. And then um, that, that what, what I'm waiting for is the next day the Fisher Ridge Cavers say, oh, wait, excuse me. <laughs> so that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. So, well, we're, we're just, just about used our time up. Um, let, let me ask um, Beth and Will individually collectively, what, what's your best memory from Mammoth Cave? If, if there's one that you can think of. Actually, my, probably my best memory of Mammoth Cave is one time when Bill Smith, who was the president of the CRF, was having a face-off with the superintendent and to the point where I was afraid these guys were going to grab each other by the necktie. And Bill was steaming, so I said, hey, Bill, we've got to cool off. And I walked him down and took, at that time, I had the key in my pocket and went in and we just walked back to main cave for about an hour, just as a very cool, relaxing trip. Great, yeah. And Beth, Beth, is there anything that stands out for you? Well, we were having a professional CRF meeting, I believe, I'm not sure, quite sure. And uh, Patty Jo Watson was there and she and I were dressed up, at that time we were dressed up in high heels and dresses okay and so uh somebody wanted to go into Flint ridge crystal, crystal cave. cave and so uh, who's going to take them well everybody else was tied up except patty joe and i and so <laughs> patty joe watson and i in our high heels <laughs> and dresses took this group into crystal cave <laughs> holy smoke the most memorable thing. <laughs> and you wore your your heels i don't Man. know Holy stuff, <laughs> man. Well, Peg, what, what about you? Is there something that, that stands out? Let's see, are y'all still there? And, and I, I'm still thinking about the heels, even just walking down the steps of the entrance. Holy smoke, man. So let's see, uh, Art, Peg, are y'all still there? Rachel Bosch. Uh-oh, have they jumped off? Uh, let me see if I see them. Oh, it looks like we have lost Art and Peg. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So, um, well, um, we'll, we'll see, see if they, they jump back on. So, um, well, I, I really do appreciate that, both the, you know, kind of up-to-date, um, uh, I, I guess, sort of description of the, of the Mammoth Cave area, essentially what I've done on my summer vacations for the last 50, 60 years. And so, uh, and what y'all have learned, that, that's been a real treat and just to kind of hear, hear about you. So um, let's see, let me, um, we're, we're gonna go ahead and I will bring up, um, introduce um, uh, Xiao Tian Hua from the Cars Institute. Let me, uh, hey, you oh, wait a minute, there, there, there's the Palmers, don't, don't, just jump back on. Can you hear me, Art? Yes, we disappeared for a moment there. Sorry. Oh, oh okay. I hope we didn't scare you away. So, um, well, we, we're just kind of wrapping up. It, it's it's about eleven um, here. Um, I, I had just wondered, um, and let me let me ask you, Peg, um, of of all the time that you've spent down here, is is there a moment that stands out, either something really good or, or maybe really bad, but just well, what 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 memory what's what stands out, either either individually or collectively. Uh, we've had really good luck at Mammoth Cave, so there's no horrible uh, experience. We did uh, spend a 17-hour trip mapping one time in Crystal Cave, only to find that a rat had stolen our key, which we left at the entrance. <laughs> and we had, fortunately had a putty knife that I was able to use to bore my way through this wooden door. Everybody always knows. And then the next week, Joe Davidson, the president of CRF, had the same thing happen to him, except it was a steel gate, and they were able to squeeze through the bars somehow. But uh, the laughter had subsided uh, from our trip by that time. Uh, I have a uh, quick answer to Alan's question about anastomosis. I'm sorry, oh, I didn't have sorry, a chance sorry. to insert this if he's still on. Um, most anastomoses are produced by back flooding from passages that are active. You have a flood and the water, instead of converging on the cave, diverges away from the cave into along, along the bedding planes, along a myriad of passages. 
and enlarges them. That's the best way to form a nest. I've always used. Also, 